thanks for watching. And since we're on a roll, we'll prove Rolle's theorem today, which is a special case of a mean value theorem, but which is used to prove the mean value theorem. It's pretty interesting. And what does it say? Actually, the statement is pretty easy. It just says, suppose you have a function whose beginning value equals to its final value. So think of this as a, b. It's a function. It starts at f of a, ends at f of b, which are equal. What it says is there must be some point where f prime equals to 0. It's a neat way of finding critical points. In other words, there must be some point where the tangent line is horizontal. So let me say that, again, if you have a continuous function on a, b that's indifferentiable on the inside, and f of a equals to f of b, then f prime of c equals to 0 for some c, c in a, b. And the funny thing about this, we will actually prove this theorem by reducing it to another theorem called Fermat's theorem, which we will actually prove too. But, so, here's the idea. Well, if the starting point equals to the ending point, unless it's a constant function, then it has to have a max or a min inside the interval. And there's a theorem that says, at a max or a min, the derivative must be zero. So, how do we know there is a max and min? It has to do with continuity. So since f is continuous on the closed interval a, b, so it's important that it's closed and it's important that it's finite. Because once it's that, it's called compact. And once you have a compact interval, you can use the extreme value theorem. So since f is continuous on a, b by the extreme value theorem, we know that f has a max, max, capital M, high max, okay, and a min, lowercase m on a b. First of all, if the max equals to the min, it means that f is constant. Let's say if the maximum, the biggest value is 10 and the smallest value is 10, f has to be between 10 and 10, so f has to be the function 10. And for a constant function, this is, we're done, because a constant function, the derivative is zero everywhere. So in particular, it's zero somewhere. So assume, we can assume that the max is not equal to the min. Okay. So assume the max is not equal to the min. And I'm claiming that one of them has to be strictly inside the interval. And the thing is, if they're outside the interval, so I'm sorry, if it's at the end point, so let's say if f of a equals to m, and remember f of a equals to f of b, then f of b has to be equal to m as well. And we have a situation like that where the maximum is attained at the end points. This is capital M, this is capital M. And well, that means that the minimum has to be attained inside the interval A, B. So the point is there is a max or a min inside the open interval A, B. And it's similar if you assume that the minimum is at the endpoints, then the maximum has to be in A, B, else the max or the min has to be in the open interval a, b. So, uh, from this discussion, we know that um, 
there is at least one max, one max or min, so some extre extremizer on the interval AB. Open interval. So there has to be at least one maximum or minimum that's not at the endpoints and it's strictly in the interval AB. And well, if there's a max or a min, without loss of generality, assume it's a max. Because the rest of the proof works if it's a min. So without loss of generality, uh, assume F has a max at some C in AB. Once we have that, we can use what's called Fermat's theorem, not to be confused with Fermat's last theorem, that's way more important. Um, so by what's called Fermat's theorem, we get that f prime of c equals to zero. So what Fermat's theorem says is that if you have a function that has a maximum on the open interval, then the derivative of that function has to be zero. And so let me state it and prove it. Again, if f is differentiable on a, b, and f has a max, or a min actually, max at c in a, b, then f prime of c equals to zero. So again, the picture is as follows. You have a point c where f has a maximum, and at that point, f prime equals to zero. And let's prove it. It's actually not that bad, and it does fit inside the margins. So again, let's not to be confused with Fermat's last theorem. And it's simply as follows. What is f prime of c? By definition, it's the limit as h goes to 0 of f of c plus h minus f of c over h. And we're assuming this limit exists but because f is differentiable at c. And in particular, if this limit exists, it means that we can approach it as a, h goes to 0 from the right, and we can approach it as h goes to 0 from the left. So again, let me draw another picture. So this is again f of c, where we have a maximum, and for example, we can approach h goes to 0 from the right. So let's compare values f of c and f of c plus h, where h is positive. So, so again, because this limit exists, it equals to the limit as h goes to 0 plus of f of c plus h plus f minus f of c over h. Okay, and as I said, let's now compare values of f of c plus h minus f of c. Notice, because f has a maximum, f of c plus h has to be smaller. What does that mean? It means suppose you have the highest grade of the class. Everyone around you must have a lower grade. Otherwise, you don't have the highest grade. Again, strict maximum. And so this is smaller than that. So in particular, if you take f of c plus h minus f of c, that is less than or equal to 0. And remember, h goes to 0 plus, so h is greater than or equal to 0. So this whole ratio, no matter what h is, again, h positive, this ratio has to be less than or equal to zero because it's a ratio of a negative number divided by a positive number. And so on the one hand, what is this ratio? It's f prime of c. So we know that f prime of c less than or equal to zero. 
Great. But again, we want to show it's equal to zero, so we're literally halfway done. And remember, as I said, this limit exists, so no matter how we approach zero, we should get the same answer. And so now, let's approach h goes to zero from the left. So let's approach c from the left. So on the other hand, this limit equals limit h goes to zero minus f of c plus h minus f of c over h. And here come the, comes the tricky thing. So I also thought, well, because we're the opposite case, it has to be positive. But no, not quite. Again, because you have a maximum f of c, it still means that from the left, values have to be smaller. So in particular, f of c plus h minus f of c, those two values, the difference still has to be negative. Which seems worrisome, but remember that in this case, h is also negative. So, in fact, you're taking this negative number and dividing it by another negative number. And so the ratio of two negative numbers then becomes positive. So, what do we have? On the one hand, f prime of c has to be less than or equal to zero. On the other hand, f prime of c has to be greater or equal to zero. And therefore, combining those two things, we get f prime of c equals to zero. So if f attains a maximum, or in fact also a minimum, uh, at a number strictly inside the interval, then the derivative has to be zero. And as we said, if you have a continuous function on a and b, you have to have such a maximum. So in fact, Rolle's theorem is true. So um, at, at least in, you know, if f of b equals to f of a. So if f of b equals to f of a, you have to have that f prime equals to zero somewhere. And maybe I didn't like, explain it clearly why you need the fact that f of a equals to f of b, but if you don't have that, then it could happen that you have a minimum or a maximum on the left-hand side and a, a minimum or maximum on the right end points, and you can't apply Fermat's theorem. It's really because the endpoints are equal that you guarantee to have a maximum or a minimum inside the interval. All right, and as I said, you can use that to prove the mean value theorem. So if you'd like this math extravaganza and you want to see more math videos, please make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much.